So thank you, yes, I appear to very much like Michigan. So, okay, joining me today, um, they'll do most of the demos, actually. Um, this is mostly for safety for me. Um, <laughs> is my graduate students, Rachel Heinemann and Garrett Mertz. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And so they'll stay up here for just a brief moment because we get to a demo pretty quickly, and then they can sit down and enjoy me worry about the three-year-old interrupting this. Okay. All right. So physics at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, we'll try to break this down into just fundamental questions. So starting with what we're built from. So this is kind of the question that I'd like to think that, that us as a species has been, have been trying to answer for, well, who knows how long? Millions of years maybe, right? Ever since, I have to say even before language, probably some early version of us was smacking rocks together to see what exactly was in the rocks. And I'd like to say that we've evolved much beyond that, but of course today we're talking about collider physics, so we're still smacking things together to see what comes out of it. Um, but nonetheless, over a period of time, that's what we've tried to do, is characterize what's the stuff that we're made of. And this, is, this became more formal a couple hundred years ago, uh, really with the advent of the periodic table. So here I show one person, Dmitry Mendeleev, who was uh, part of the early formation of the periodic table. And one thing to note is, is Mendeleev was not the only person at the time who was developing the periodic table. Many, many physicists were. And this is an important thing in science is, is to note that we tend to have a little bit of a hero complex where we say one person is responsible for everything, and that's certainly not the way it is. Many physicists come together to make uh, large gains, and this is just one of them. Okay, so you can see here, this is one of the early form, the early, early uh, productions of the periodic table, you can see here at 1869 is when this was done. And the way that he went about it is, as you can imagine at the time they have, you know, things were along the lines of, okay, I know what sodium is, I know what helium, I know what hydrogen, I know what this stuff is, I know if I mix it together it does this cool <laughs> reaction. And so maybe I can try to organize this in some way. I can organize it by mass. I can organize it by how it reacts. And this is effect effectively what people were doing at the time. And so you can see this early version of it. And what he found was patterns, okay? And so many other people, of course, found patterns along this line. And eventually, over time, and a lot of effort and measurement, we filled out the periodic table, okay? And so this was a great period of understanding for us. You know, I, different elements are made up of different types of atoms. These types of atoms have different numbers of electrons, have different masses, lots of measurements go into this until we have a, an understanding. Um, and certainly this has made great progress in the human condition. Nonetheless, there were issues early at the time. There were issues already that we didn't quite understand. In particular, many of the atoms were, or many of the elements were radioactive. For example, uranium. Okay, and radioactive meaning that they seem to be just decaying spontaneously. Okay, they were not stable. All right, this had sometimes actually fatal consequences. And so uranium, as an example of kind of a misunderstanding of how we handled radioactive material at the time, Rachel's going to show us a few things, a few <laughs> examples of those early misunderstandings. Rachel has a Geiger counter, okay, which is basically a gas chamber under high voltage, and so when radiation hits it, okay, it ionizes the gas on the inside and creates a little spark, and you can hear that spark. So Rachel, why don't you show us what you got? Okay, uh, so as Tom mentioned, this is an example of a Geiger counter. Um, this is one that you can tell by this nice peppermint color scheme, it's straight out of the 50s, but a great time for radioactivity. Uh, so you might notice that it's going off and doing these clicking noises a bit right now. Um, these clicking noises uh, correspond, or the rate corresponds to how much radiation we're detecting right now. And so I'm not really pointing at anything, but this tells us that there is some background level of radiation. And we know this, and this is relatively low, 
and nothing that's really too dangerous or something to worry about. <laughs> so we have, of course, some other samples here that may be a little bit more radioactive than our background. Uh, one being this fancy plate here called Fiestaware. So Fiestaware is a type of ceramic ware that was really popular um, back in the 1940s and 50s and is still a collector's item today. Um, it started, or the company started in the 1930s, and one of, or one of these colors, um, specifically this sort of orangey red color, um, the glaze actually contains uranium. So if we <laughs> point our handy Geiger counter, <laughs> you can see that this is relatively radioactive and maybe not a good idea to be eating off of all of the time. <laughs> Um, I will say the Fiesta Ware company actually discontinued um, this uranium glaze um, during World War II, um, not actually due to safety concerns, but because uranium sources were taken over by the US government for the war effort. <laughs> um, you, uh, so any Fiesta Ware that you buy now is probably not radioactive, don't worry. Nobody, no other company is using radioactive glaze that we know of. But if you come, o come across an older Fiesta Ware fancy orange plate, be a little careful before you cut up your steak on it. <laughs> um, we have a couple other sources here as well, um, one being this very fancy alarm clock here. Uh, so the, di or the uh, numbers on this are actually painted uh, with a radioactive source, with radium, so it'll glow in the dark, which of course sounds really nice for an alarm clock um, since it needs no electricity to glow. However, you can see that it is relatively strongly radioactive, and you can imagine this is probably not something that you'd want to put next to your face every night for many years. Um, this also led to some other problems. So uh, painting uh, clock faces with uh, radium and radium dyes was actually relatively common, especially during World War II. Um, the radium, since it glows, was seen as a very good option for military usage, so particularly for military watches. Um, this led to a lot of women being contracted to do the painting of these watch faces. And if you can imagine how it's probably not great to have this near your face, imagine how great it is to be painting this and then using your lips in order to refine your paintbrush um, with the paint on it and painting your teeth with radium as well. So we've learned a lot since those days. But it's worth noting that um, radioactive materials still have really um, important uses that we do understand very well and are relatively safe, safe today. Uh, one being, probably one of the most annoying pieces of household equipment, though it is very safe, is your smoke detector. So the way that smoke detectors work is that we have um, a radiation source inside, um, inside the little, um, these little capsule things. We emit alpha particles and we have a detector that um, reads the rate of the alpha particle decay or basically looks at how radioactive it is. This one's coded so you're not going to really get much of a reading from it. Also, I think it's actually been taken out. <laughs> um, so if there's a lot of smoke, then this sort of blocks the radiation from being detected and then your detector knows that there is something clouding up the air like smoke. We have an example of the core down here. If I can manage to get it off, here we go. Uh, so just so you can see, the inside is very tiny. And you can see that it is relatively strongly radioactive. Um, but again, this is actually something that um, is relatively safe. It is very contained. And it's also worth noting that uh, this is a smoke detector design that is now outdated. However, if you have an older smoke detector in your home, it may still use this. No. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Okay, so obviously it takes a lot of progress to go from the periodic table to what our current understanding is, and we just don't have time to go through all of that slow involvement, so we'll go right to our understanding today and the issues that we have with that understanding. Um, this is a video made by CERN that uh, is kind of a good way to understand the structure of things and how we understand that now. And so I'll kind of guide you through this. Unfortunately, so what this is is, is a zooming in of a human hair and all the pieces that are part of that. It takes a really long time to get to the point where I know what we're looking at. <laughs> so there's a lot of hair stuff and then finally we get to molecules and I'm back to where I understand what things are. So I don't know what any of this stuff is. 
we're down to 10 microns. Apparently, a human hair is a lot more complicated than I had thought it was. I'd like to think, at this point, I thought, okay, these are strands, right? But then it breaks down even further, and like, there's more strands. And now we're to somewhere where actually I feel comfortable. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so molecules, all right? And as you zoom into molecules, molecules are made up of atoms. All right, so here are the individual atoms that are making up the molecules. You zoom in further, you get to singular atoms. And as you break into the atom, you get to the areas that the electrons occupy, and that's those bulbs. And now you keep going down farther and farther and farther for a very long way until you get to the nucleus. All right. And then the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, which are held together by the strong force. And if you break inside those guys, which we'll do in a second, you can see the constituents of a nucleus are these three balls, which are quarks. Okay? And quarks are fundamental particles. By fundamental, we mean that they're point particles. You can't cut them up. All right? We consider them fundamental. This is a complete picture of what we understand today. You should look at this a lot like we look at the periodic table. All right? So what we have here are the quarks. Whoops. No, I don't want to watch this again. Ah, okay. Laser. Here we go. So this is matter, all right, on this side. And on this side, these are the forces that interact with matter. Some of this stuff you're familiar with, okay? So up and down quark, this is what you just saw, makes up atoms, all right? Those are held together by the strong force, all right, which is a particle called the gluon, all right? They interact with each other. They interact with the electron, and they do that through a photon, okay? Now, it turns out that this row right here is all the stuff that we're familiar with. Around us, this is what everything is made of. So this, and for the most part, this, okay, is our world. However, there are bigger versions of this, heavier versions. Bigger is the wrong word, okay? So a second family and a third family that interact very much like this one, all right? However, they're just heavier. We do not know why they're there, all right? They seem to pick, play no purpose in our everyday lives. They're effectively relics of the Big Bang, meaning that they were there at the very, very early in the beginning. For example, top quarks were around about 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, and they disappeared only to be reborn by lowly physicists years later. Okay? We don't know why that is. Nonetheless, when we collide things at very high energy, these are the kind of things that pop out. All right? We'll talk more about these in a second. The forces, well, we talked about the electromagnetic force and the strong force. There's also this Z boson and W boson. All right, these are just words, so don't worry so much about like, the fact that they have strange names. Just note that like, this right here is, is responsible, for example, radioactive decay. Okay? All of these things have mass. All right? By mass, what I mean is, is imagine I take an element, like a proton, and I go out into space where there's no gravity, okay? and I push it. All right? Well, it's going to take a little bit to push it. It's going to resist. Okay? They, it has mass. Like I said, these ones have mass, these ones have higher mass, and these ones even have more mass. That mass you need to look at as no different than an electric charge. All right? Say I have two magnets, all right? and I put them close together. If they're weak magnets, they don't pull quite as hard. If they're strong magnets, they pull very hard. All right? That charge is what's responsible for how strong that they pull. Okay? The Higgs boson is the thing that actually gives these things mass, and so you need to think of mass a lot like you think of charge. All right? The more massive something is, the more that the Higgs affects it. The Higgs is what ties all of this together, and we'll discuss the Higgs a little bit more soon. However, there's a misconception, a, a really fundamental misconception, and it's that all of this picture, periodic table, and the core or the standard model that we show, we look at them a lot like ping pong balls that we put together, Legos, right? Okay, so I take one atom, I put it next to another atom, another atom, and poof, I've got me, right? However, that's not really how we exist at the fundamental level. We're much more like waves on an ocean, all right, or waves on water. 
And we know this, well, we know this for a, a couple of reasons, but the reason I bring this up is, is it'll make what we talk about in a second a lot more digestible, believe it or not. Okay? So what does it mean to be a wave? All right? So what I have is an example at the very top. All right? So imagine that you and your best buddy are in a bathtub splashing water at each other. Okay? The green wave can be one person and the blue wave another. Okay, now look at the green wave as it's traveling this way and the blue wave as it's traveling this way. Now as you're looking at this bathtub, what you're going to see is, is there's places where the waves as they're traveling towards each other where they add up and make something bigger like you see here in the red. And there are places where they come across each other where a low point hits a high point and they cancel out and you see nothing. Okay. So wave-wise, wave if you saw this in your bathtub, this wouldn't bugger you, all right? Now, if I took two baseballs and I threw them at each other and suddenly they disappeared when they hit, that'd bugger you, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> this is the difference between wave-like behavior and particle-like behavior. We can see this in nature. And so a good example is, is you can't see this guy here, but what he has is, is he has a couple of like Nerf balls on sticks and he's hitting them on the water. Okay, and what that shows you here along these lines is, is there's spots where those add, okay, down the metal, and the spots where those disappear, okay, and that is no different than the picture that we see up here, and this, of course, verifies, as we said, that water is wave-like, all right, no shock to any of us, all right. Let's go one step further, and you've heard about light waves, right, light is wave is wave-like. And we can see an example of this. I've done this demo for many, many students, and I think it's responsible for thinning hair. Let's see if I can pull one out. It shouldn't be. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I've got a little hair, all right? Now I'm going to shine this laser light on it, and the way that you can think of it is, is a little bit like the two balls going like this, all right? And so light is going to go around one way, and light is going around the other, and you can think of them as like two sources. And then later on, far down the line, there'll be places where those two sources add and places where those two sources disappear. And if we see something like that, we know, okay, yeah, light is a wave. All right, so let's try to get this with my laser pointer. All right, do you see the dashes? Let's use a far more serious, this is an out of spec laser from a foreign country that shouldn't be selling it. There she goes. Okay. Now, where those dashes sit, for those of you who are in the overflow room, um, we're looking at a green laser shined on a hair that makes a bunch of a straight line of bright spots and dark spots. Okay. And so, those dark spots, where those where those are and where those are not, are actually directly related to the thickness of my hair. Okay. And so we can use that. In fact, that's an experiment that many students do early on in their, their um, undergraduate career, is they use this to measure the thickness of their hair. Okay? In fact, I think, Becca, did I have you guys do this as a homework assignment? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> right. So this was done as a homework assignment, apparently, at one point. Okay? You can measure the thickness of your hair with it. But in that thickness, those dashes there are very related to the energy that's coming out of this, the energy of the photons, which means that you can, if you have a higher and higher energy, you can probe smaller and smaller distances, okay? Now, here we just talked about light. Um, we've talked about not just light, but let's talk about, yeah, matter as well, okay? And so what Garrett's going to show you here, well, I'll let you do it. So. Okay, um, so I'm going to warm this up and I'll talk a little bit about it while it's warming up. Uh, so this is an electron diffraction experiment. Um, so what this is, is on the back of this, we have an electron gun. Um, this is the same kind of thing that's in old cathode ray TVs, um, where it would fire electrons at the screen. Uh, and then, thanks. So you have an electron gun that shoots electrons. Uh, there is a target, um, which in this case is a, a little slab of graphite, um, kind of like a little grating, where um, the spaces between the atoms are a grating. Uh, electrons will hit the target. Some of them will go through different holes in the, in the grating. 
Uh, and what you would expect to see is if these are, if, if electrons are purely the ping pong ball particle model uh, and they're not waves at all, you would essentially just see like a pattern of holes um, where they would just be shot straight through the grating. Yeah, think about it like um, if you had a box with some holes in it and you were throwing baseballs and you looked on the other side, you'd just see spots where the baseballs got through the holes, mm -hmm. but nothing more. But so in this case, what we see actually is, um, yeah, actually this is a pretty good place to have it. You can kind of see a little bit if you squint. Um, <laughs> uh, you, see, you see a pattern of rings. Um, you see, again, areas where you have constructive interference, which yeah, is the peaks. Try to get it for you. You're right, Nick, this one isn't so great. <laughs> Okay, what you want to see is, is rings, okay? Yeah. And so green rings, concentric green rings. All right, mm -hmm. we have a little bit of an old gun here, so, yeah. and it needs to warm up some, so you can't completely see it, but um, hopefully you can spot the green rings. In particular, let me try to point it out for you. Here, yeah. right, and here, okay? You also see in between them, you see uh, troughs. Like there's yeah, rings it's much more there's visible, like right here. So if you come up afterwards and you can take a look at it, mm -hmm. okay? We if can you don't believe me, that there's rings. <laughs> <things. laughs> okay. You turn down the light, then you can see that. Nick, you want to try? Oh, the spotlight. Oh, it's that one right there, huh? Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll have to move on. All right. So, Go. All right, come up and take a look at it afterwards, okay? So you can kind of see where the rings are. But the point is, is the fact that you see rings tells you that electrons indeed are waves, all right? And you can see this in a lot of different cases, not just here. But this was an er example of an early experiment where this wave-like behavior of matter started to become apparent. Okay, why do I bring this up? Because if we're gonna understand how particles are if we're going to understand how we if we're going to understand how things are structured, okay, then we can't just talk about the pieces, but then how they interact with each other, okay? And the way that we describe this as particle physicists, oh, thanks, Nick, is through Feynman diagrams, okay? And a Feynman diagram isn't so complicated, all right? All it is is that you have time in one direction here and then kind of positioned in the other. And so what you're seeing here up top is, is a photon, you imagine an electron flying along, minding its own business, and a photon comes out of nowhere and smacks it and gives it a little bit more energy, all right? That's what this is, all right? That's maybe a little bit more um, understandable, or even in a ping pong ball kind of way, than the bottom one. So the bottom one is two electrons coming, okay, coming across to each other colliding and then suddenly turning into a photon. And this is more along the lines of what we talked about, seeing like two tennis balls coming out of nowhere, colliding together and then t suddenly take, turning into a ping pong ball. That's weird, right? However, if we look at it like waves, it's a little bit more digestible, right? Two waves, if you were looking at an ocean and you saw two waves coming together and they kind of combined and then it kind of went forward as a single wave, might weird you out a little, but not weirding you out as much as like two tennis balls making a ping pong ball. All right, and so that's what I want you to think of here, is that each one of these you can look at as belonging to kind of an ocean. Okay, so to understand this picture here as physicists, what our job is is to map all of the different ways that they interact. Now this is a big table of diagrams that I don't expect you to look at and say, wow, that makes total sense to me, all right? All I want you to do is, is note that basically all this does is, is say all the different ways that say a photon can interact with quarks. See these Qs, quarks? Or a photon can interact with leptons, these guys down here, all right? Or a gluon can interact with quarks. This is a mapping. And these are the things that particle physicists want to study and codify, okay? So no different than looking at the periodic table and looking at an element and saying, I want to know how that thing reacts or looking at that element and saying, I want to know what its mass is, all right? That's what this picture is, okay? Now there's an equation that, <laughs> give me just a second. There's an equation that determines what all of these reactions should happen, how often they should happen, how strong that force should be, okay? And it's, here's a t-shirt of that. 
that is worn by someone who does not want to make friends. <laughs> so this is a um, overly expanded version of something that's far more simple and beautiful, okay? And that fits on a coffee cup, all right? <laughs> and so now you might look at this and say, I still don't know what that means, all right? And that's okay, right? And so what I, you know, it's, it's no different than if you put um, German in front of me, right? I don't speak German. I would not understand what's there. Okay, you need someone to translate, all right? And the best thing I could come up with was this thing I found on hieroglyphics, which show, okay, there's a lot of, oh, oh, I missed my hieroglyphic joke. All right, so here are different hieroglyphics, right? And here are the translations. Now, we don't know what those symbols mean. Same thing we don't really, well, I know what these symbols mean, but <laughs> you don't know what these symbols mean, okay? But they look vaguely familiar, and then there's a translation here to what those things are, okay? And so that's what the role I'll play is, is translator, okay? And so here's our coffee cup, and here's what each thing means, okay? Now don't worry so much about the details, just bear with me. The first line describes all the force carriers, okay? Photons, gluons, things like that, all right? The second line describes quarks and leptons and how they interact, okay? So remember how we talked about two electrons to meet together and making a photon, all right? That's what this does, okay, that's this line. All right, the third and the fourth line describe the Higgs boson, okay? And this is really important, right? So I'm telling you that this equation is super important and dictates the physics of the small, right? And two out of the four lines of my little equation here are around the Higgs boson. So you can understand that like, for example, in 2012, when the Higgs boson was discovered, how much excitement there was around it, this is why it plays such a big role. Okay, so how to think about the Higgs. The Higgs is special, all right? And we can't dive into all of the details of all the problems the Higgs fi fixes, but the way to think about it is, is like this. In the early parts of the universe, things didn't have mass. So whether you're a photon, which travels around at the speed of light, or an electron or a top quark, you travel around completely free. But at some point, the Higgs field turns on. All right, and all these Higgs bosons start attack, attracting them, or attaching themselves to all the particles, and they happen to attach themselves to top quarks more than other things, okay? For example, and this creates this molasses-like field that we exist in, all right? And here this shows like what this looks like in a collider. Don't worry about that part. We'll talk more about that later, all right? So effectively, the Higgs is a little bit like... Um, Oh, Martin's not here. Imagine kids in daycare, right? In the morning, there's no toys on the floor and they're just running around like crazy, right? But over time, Legos and things like that scatter across the floor, slowing down the running around like crazy, right? And that's a little bit like the Higgs field, okay? Over time, these folks get slowed down, all right? Okay. What I want to do today is to show you a particular example of a measurement. Okay, so you get a sense of like when all these measurements come out of the LHC, which it's a lot. It's a program that's on the scale of measuring all the particles that are in the periodic table. Okay, so that's vast and hard to understand all of that. So let's just try to break down one and we'll do one that's recently very important. Okay, and that's how the Higgs interacts with top quarks. Now remember I said top quarks are really, really he heavy on the order of the, the mass of a silver atom. Okay, that's super heavy. All right, so that means the Higgs really likes top quarks. And so what we're going to try to do is, is study how the Higgs and the top quarks interact with each other. Now, again, this diagram might bugger you a little bit, but remember back to what we talked about with electrons. We were all okay with electrons coming together and forming a photon and that photon traveling forward, right? So let's be okay with the idea of a Higgs boson traveling along and breaking up into two top quarks. The thing that I want to point out is, is this little y, which you can see over here. Okay, this is the thing that we're going to measure, all right? No different than the speed of light or things like that. It's a constant that we're going to measure, and that tells us how much the Higgs boson likes top quarks. That's what we want to get after, and that was not measured within the last couple years, with the last year. All right, how do we go about this? And this is where the collider comes in, all right? So what we do is, is we collide protons. So here's our protons. They've got quarks inside. Inside those quarks, they're attracted, or they have gluons that are holding them together. 
We smash them together, and what we hope happens is, is that these two gluons interact with each other, produce top quarks and a Higgs boson. Okay, so here are the top quarks here. Okay, don't, this is a little funky, don't worry about it so much, all right? Just note that these are top quarks and there's a Higgs. And this right here is this right here, just flipped, okay? So if we can measure how, if we can measure this interaction and study it, then we can get a hold of this, then we know this, okay? This is the recent result on measuring the Higgs boson's interaction with top quarks, which you've seen in papers maybe. Little level papers, like second page CNN. Kind of, right? Okay, so how do we collide protons? The Large Hadron Collider. All right, so Large Hadron Collider is a big giant ring of magnets and parts that do the accelerating, all right, that circulate protons in one direction and protons in another direction. And then we have a few points where the beams cross, all right? When they cross, they collide and produce a collision. So this happens at 13 TeV. 13 TeV is a lot. However, we should be humbled a little bit by this. And that 13 TeV, well, 100 billion collisions at 13 TeV is the energy that you consume when you eat a chocolate bar, okay? So it's not that much energy, and it's a little bit humbling to us that to extract a little bit of the energy of a chocolate bar, we need something that's 17 miles around, right? Okay. However, the LHC produces about a billion collisions a second, very, very fast, okay? And so we produce a chocolate bar every 100 seconds. It's maybe overkill in producing chocolate bars, but <laughs> here we are. Okay, this is what it looks like on the inside. It, there's, it's kind of interesting. There's bicycles everywhere, so you can ride around and things like that. I mean, for the people that work on it, it's a radioactive environment, so only certain people can do that. There's go-karts. Go-karts is the wrong word, but I like to think that they're go-karts. Okay, and so here's a graphic of basically how it works. Animation. So the protons go through series, a series of loops, all right, which accelerate them more and more and more, okay? Getting them faster and faster to the speed of light. Once they get to the speed of light, we're essentially adding energy through mass, all right? Finally, they get to the big giant 27 kilometer circle, and they're going fast enough so that we have, we're ready for collisions. This is inside the tube. You can see protons zipping along. We go through the French-Swiss border. There's our proton with three quarks. And finally, at the point where the beams cross is where they collide. And there, of course, we placed some kind of detector, something where we can observe what happens. Okay, they collide and hopefully something amazing happens like the collision that we talked about where top quarks and the Higgs are produced. Okay, so how do we observe this? Well, we observe it through, there's multiple detectors there. I'll talk about the detector that we work on, all right, the Atlas detector. So here you can see it, it's big, complicated. You can see the scale here, there's people these people who are not very safe, right? okay? The way to look at this machine, well, let's, I can show you some pictures of it, okay? So this is staring directly down the center of it as they're sliding the core in, okay? And you can see this guy right here very confidently standing for scale. Okay, and then after that, once that's done, we put on these giant rings. That's these things right here at the end. Actually, that one's this one, okay? and see people for scale. Actually, one of these entire wheels right here was built here at Michigan. Okay, so back to this detector. How do we detect things? Okay, so what I wanna do is, is I'm gonna try to cut this thing into slices. I'm gonna look at it as we're looking down the pipe this way, and we're gonna cut it in half, and just look at a portion of it to try to explain how the thing works, all right? Now the thing is basically these concentric layers of different types of detectors. We talked about how particles interact in different ways, right? Well, that means that they interact in different ways. We have to invent detectors that can detect them in different ways. We have to rely on those interactions to detect them. And so there's all sorts of complicated pieces and magnets and stuff that are part of this. We're only gonna look at one of those in a second. But for now, 
If I cut it in half and look, what you see is, is different particles have different signatures through this kind of layered onion thing. All right, there's these inner detectors that look at tracks of charged particles. Okay, there's pieces of calorimeter, all right, which are very similar to kind of like how this works actually. All right, where a particle, if it hits it, creates a shower of energy. All right, and there's stacks of, I think this is like lead in scintillator, um, that when larger particles like protons and neutrons, when they hit them, they create other showers. So we can, anytime we see kind of a combination of these things, we can reconstruct them and say, ah, I've got a proton in this case, or ah, I've got a muon. All right, you can see a muon here, which we'll describe in a second, is somebody who goes all the way through. All right. Okay. I only want to look at a slight sliver of this, all right? In particular, the part where Michigan is responsible, which is the muon detector system. That's kind of everything in blue here, all right? So one of these chambers is made up by, a lack of way of saying it any other way, a series of tubes, okay? So a series of tubes like this, which you can come up and play with if you want. All this is is an aluminum tube, and there's a, this one doesn't have it, but there's a wire that runs down the center, and we fill it with gas. And so when a particle goes through it, it ionizes the gas. There's a voltage between the wire in the middle and the outside sheath, all right, which is aluminum, and it creates like a little lightning spark. And that little lightning spark, then it gets read out, and we say, ah, something hit it. Okay? And so if you have a bunch of these tubes, all that see that, like in a line, okay, like this, all right, you can say, ah, something flew through there, right? Okay, and that's how we detect the muon, all right? And so this is, Garrett, did you take this picture? I did. <laughs> it's a very nice picture. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, so here's one of these chambers. Okay, this is Curtis from Michigan, all right? And these are tubes. We have a really, really fancy glue gun that glues them all together. All right, and that's what an example of like as a track went through here, you'd see all of that, okay? So here's another cute animation of how this works. Look, there's another person, right? This is like really unsafe. Okay, so that's the entire muon spectrometer, so all the detectors. And so if you went over and popped open one of these chambers, I don't know why there's a CD there. Okay. Now you can scale, yeah. So now you can see one of these tubes, all right, with a wire down the center. And so as a particle goes through there, ionizes the gas. So you get a bunch of ions and electrons. Those flow out to the edges of the tube in the center wire. And from that, you can determine where exactly they went through in the wire. And in turn, once you have that information from each of the tube, you can draw a nice straight line. Okay, and so this is just one of several systems that operate in very different ways. One of the ways that we test these detectors is through cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are all around us. If you could change your vision right now, you would see this waterfall of particles hitting us all the time. In fact, like, um, for example, every time you take an airplane flight, you'd get to, uh, from here to California, you get to equivalent of the radiation of like an X-ray, because there's so much cosmic radiation at that level, okay? So there's low energy ones that come from supernovas and giant events like that, and then there's really high energy ones that light up the sky, all right? Light up in a way that you can't see, but, okay? So they come in, they collide with the atmosphere and create a shower of particles. The really high energy ones, we have no idea where they come from. We only know that they don't come from our galaxy. They're far more energetic than anything that we could ever produce in a collider, okay? They just come randomly and not often enough for us to really use them in the kind of way that we use them for the Large Hadron Collider. When they hit, they hit something and look, this looks just like those Feynman diagrams before. So it's the same kind of physics. So all sorts of interactions happen. They create a shower of stuff. And one of the things they create is muons, okay? And so you'll remember in the very beginning with Rachel was holding up this 
counter, this Geiger counter, and it was making clicks even when it wasn't near radioactive sources. Okay, now some of that could be just radiation in the room, and some of that is cosmic radiation that's hitting it. We have a cosmic ray detector. I think you actually you saw this a couple weeks ago, which is a real bummer for me, but okay. And so we'll show you in a second that works, and it works, this is the cosmic radiation, or the cosmic ray de detector, and it works very similar to how we detect here. So this is the Atlas detector. You'll see cuts like this all the time where we've removed pieces of the detector so you can see better how it's made. Okay, and so here's a cosmic ray that's coming straight through. And so let's show the cosmic ray detector here. So this is our cosmic ray telescope. Um, it's both a detector and a telescope because you can, it actually does have, we're seeing things come in from space, which is what telescopes do. Uh, so one of the things that I think is cool about cosmic ray muons, um, so this is also, the muon was discovered by looking at cosmic rays. The quote that the physicists said when they were looking at the uh, uh, picture, an uh, image from something similar to this was who ordered that? Uh, no, no one was expecting those before. So this is, this comes in two parts. The top panel uh, is this, this yellow pulse on the oscilloscope, and the bottom panel is this blue pulse. So what we try to do is we want to make sure we get a muon that goes through both. Uh, if we get one that just comes to the side or something like that, it might not be quite what we're looking for. Uh, so we have these two pulses here, um, and it's kind of hard to see. So if I push this button here, you can hear. So every click that you hear is a muon that is passing through both detectors at the same time. It's very similar to a Geiger counter, uh, like Rachel was showing before, uh, but this is bigger and specifically designed to look at things from space. Uh, we also use cosmic rays to calibrate some of the hardware for the Atlas detector, um, in particular these, those muon chambers that Tom was showing off, um, or was talking about and then showed the tube from. Uh, one of the ways you can make sure the electronics works is by tracking cosmic rays just to make sure everything sorts out okay. So they're very, like, they're a cool thing to look at, but they're also very useful for what we're doing. Yeah, that's a sore point for Garrett because he's been working on a task where he's characterizing one of these detectors with cosmic rays for some time. So mm -hmm. I could tell the little bit of venom in his eyes. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. All right, so after this, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so in the detector, how we're interested in them is, is of course, if they're decaying in such a way that we can see something cool, okay? So imagine you have a Higgs boson. Don't worry about how, just remember there's different types of interactions. So a Higgs can decay into two Z bosons, and those Z bosons and can turn and decay to muons, all right? And that's what this you see in this detector. You can see four different muons going through. Now you've all have heard of this famous equation, E equals MC squared. Right? So I can add the energy that I find in all of these muons together, and what that should tell me is, if I add it all up, it'll tell me what the mass is, the mass energy is, of this original Higgs. And we can make a plot of that. And this is what is done. So what you can imagine what this looks like is, is this is the mass energy here that we find by adding all these up, the energy of all these up, okay? And E, this is a histogram, so every time you see a little, there's a, every time we get a collision and we measure the energy of all of these things, we say, ah, the, energy, the mass of all of this is 140, all right? And we put a little bump here. And you keep doing this over and over again, collecting events, until you make this chart, all right? And so what you can see here in red, this is the stuff we don't want, and we have predictions for how often that could occur. Don't want as in, like, these are backgrounds, okay? But we also have predictions for how often the Higgs occurs, all right? And that's this blue thing here. And so every once in a while, we add all this together, and we get a mass of 125 GeV. Don't worry about the units. Just know that that's kind of what we're hoping to find. And you get a nice big spike here. And that means that for a large portion of these types of collisions, all right, we're seeing a spike right here. This is the Higgs boson. Okay. So how we make measurements. Back to what we were talking about here. So we have this Higgs that's, a K, that's interacting with two top quarks. And if you remember, we were doing this by colliding protons made of gluons that were interacting through tops and creating a Higgs boson. 
This is what that looks like in a detector. Now this looks meaningless other than it's pretty, okay? So all you need to know is, is that if I have a couple of top quarks and a Higgs boson and they produce something that, like a bunch of quarks and a bunch of electrons and photons and things like that, that shows up in the detector in a very particular way, all right? And so that allows us to say, ah, look, this is a top quark, or ah, look, this is what a Higgs looks like, all right? And so it has a signature. Unfortunately, that signature is also made by many other processes, all right, many other types of physics, okay? Again, don't worry, this can look like some, you don't need to worry about what the details of this look like, you just know that there's a bunch of stuff that gets created that we're not interested in, all right? In fact, far more of the stuff that we're not interested in gets created than the stuff that we are. These are backgrounds, and they come about by the fact that, well, remember, we take one billion collisions per second, okay? And this is a huge problem. So the digital, digital information of each collision is about 1 to 10 megabytes, and that means with our storage capacity, we can store about 1,000 collisions um, per second. All right? That's not a lot, right? So we have to do a really good job of pulling out what we think is great and what we don't want and throwing it away. Okay? Even after all of that, you get 20 petabytes of, petabytes of data that we have to sift through to try to find something. Okay, 20 petabytes, one petabyte is one million gigabytes? Yeah, one million gigabytes. Okay, so that's a lot, all right? And so if you stack, if you put all that in CDs and you stacked it up, that would be 20 kilometers high, far higher than Jets Fly and Mount Everest. That's kind of a cheesy graphic. All right. <laughs> Ultimately, it means that finding a Higgs event is like looking for one person in a thousand of the world's population. We're not just looking for a Higgs event. We're looking for a Higgs event with top quarks, which is even 100 times more rare. How do we do it? Okay, well, we rely on very advanced techniques. And so, all right, maybe we can't count the number of jets, the number of quarks, leptons, but what we can do is to study their energies, study the angles that they come off of, all those kind of properties, and make plots of those. And what you see up here are just four examples, one of them being like the photon, all right? Here's a photon. What's the energy of that photon? Turns out that for the stuff we're interested in in red, that's different than the stuff that we're not, which is in black, okay? We can use that information. So look at it like, okay, I pull out an event and I look at its properties and I say, oh, it's got a really heavy photon. Okay, it's more likely to be something I'm interested in. How many jets does it have? Oh, it has many jets. All right, that's one more thing I'm interested in. You add all that information up and together, and at the end of it, you can say, wow, if I add in all those probabilities, it's really likely that this is going to be something great. Okay? The way we go about this is machine learning. All right? So machine learning has a long history in this field. It really cut its teeth, well, it says in the 80s, but if, you know, I think in about the 2000s is when it was used incredibly seriously to find things. <clears throat> so we rely on machine learning techniques to train about what these events look like and what they don't. Okay, and you, look at it, you can look at it a lot like how my three-year-old learns. All right? My three-year-old is interested in mom, not interested in not mom. Right? <laughs> okay? And so the three-year-old, to find out when, it's, when he's looking at somebody, if that's mom or not mom, goes through a series of questions. Does it look like mom? Does it sound like mom? All right, so we do the same. Is the event very high energy? Does the event have electrons? And so on and so forth. And after all those decisions get processed through this entire network, at the very end, well, it's mom. Great, that's fantastic, okay? Not mom, keep looking. <laughs> okay, we do the same thing, all right? Now, what this plot does is says how good we are at finding signal, this blue, versus background, all right, or mom versus not mom, okay? If these were much more blurred together, all right, we're not very good at it, okay? It means that every once in a while when we think we've found the thing we're interested in, turns out it's not. But the fact that we have really good separation between these two means that if I drop an event in and it ends up being right here, well, it's very, very likely that it's signal and very unlikely that it's background. That's what this means. 
And so we use all of that and we take all this information that we get out of the detector from all the events and we put it, put it through our machine learning algorithm. And then we let it go and we look at all the energy that's going through that event and we start making a plot of it. And after a long period of time, it collects and you can see here that you get a, bite, a nice hump right about 125. And if you remember, that's exactly where those four muons combined, all right, also combined at 125. And so that means, indeed, we have found a Higgs boson in events that are populated with top quarks. We make a measurement. You don't need to worry about the measurements, what the units are. This basically just tells us this is, you know, no, you, we often can go from like kilometers to miles to things like that. And so this is just a unit that says how often something happens, okay? And so this is what was measured, all right, 710 femtobarns. There's uncertainties. Things are not a measurement unless there's an uncertainty, right? If someone tells you, um, yeah, 90% of the time this medical technique works, and you ask, okay, but what's the uncertainty? And they tell you, well, plus or minus 50%. Maybe don't go through that procedure, right? <laughs> Okay, so an uncertainty needs to be tacked to a measurement, and these are the uncertainties. So we're fairly certain that we see it, okay, but not all the way. The gold standard is five sigma, which this is an older result, and so just very recently, uh, Rachel and Garrett were very much a part of this, produced a five sigma result, which confirms this, which we're not showing. Okay, and so the first time this came out, this was a big deal, and all the fame and fortune that like I said, second page CNN articles and blogs will give you. <laughs> and the people that worked on it, Rachel and Garrett, who are up here, uh, Noah Zipper, an undergraduate student, and um, Allison Diana, who was my former postdoc, who is now a faculty member. Okay, but remember this is just one small piece, right? Just one small piece, and that's actually right here, Higgs with two top quarks in a much wider picture of measurements that need to be made to understand the standard model. And so again, this is a blinding plot, right? And you don't need to worry about anything other than it, other than there's a lot of dots, okay? And a lot of these dots mean that all these different processes we're trying to measure. All of these right here correspond to things here, okay? And we make all these different measurements, and as you go downwards, this is harder and harder okay, to measure, and so we're trying to verify all of that. This is no different than what you see as a modern periodic table, where people did things like measure ionization energy, atomic number, ground state configuration, what the mass is, things like this, okay? That's what we're doing. Now, the issue with this is, is that this beautiful picture, which the standard model very much well predicts, doesn't predict everything. And so there's a bunch of questions that we can't answer, all right? What is dark matter? Why is there only matter in the universe, not antimatter, all right? Antimatter should be produced equally with matter. Is the Higgs more complicated? There's reasons to believe that that sector should be far more complicated than it is. Why only three generations of matter? Like we talk about those three families, right? Like we're only made up of the first family, why the other two families are there? Okay, another blinding plot. Um, all this does is, is these are what are called searches, all right? And so many, many physicists do what are called searches. And they're there, they're not necessarily trying to measure something. They're looking for something new. So they're looking at a particular area, trying to see if it corresponds to something we understand, and really hoping that it doesn't, right? And so here, whoops, there's nothing really to show other than see, okay, here's dark matter here. Okay, and all sorts of different things. So different types of searches are done. These bars indicate how far that we've looked in that region. How good did we really search for the thing, all right? And the goal is, is to keep making these bars go farther and farther and farther. Okay, there's a lot of hope, all right? So, so far, despite the fact that this thing has been running for a bit, we've only collected 5% of the total amount of data that we will collect over the lifetime of the experiment. All right, these experiments are big, right? And they, they're expensive and they last a very long time, as they should. And so it takes a bit to get up to the point where you're just here. And over time, we'll keep doing a little bit of upgrades and doing better and better until we get more and more data. And so here, 
at some point in 2037, and the thing that hit me in 2037 is my 14-year-old daughter will be 33 years old at that <laughs> time, which really is rough for me. Um, <laughs> right, so it's a long period of time before we'll collect 100%. And so a lot of measurements we can do between now and then to um, further refine our understanding of the standard model, but also hopefully find something new. It's too much though, I listed some big questions, and these are big questions, right? Dark matter, three generations of matter. And it would be just wonderful to be able to answer one. These are fundamental questions about our existence. All right, so my hope very much is, is that within this time period, something gets answered. But it might be too greedy. We just answered, what is mass, right? And so, who knows what will happen. But I think we always remain hopeful, right? Okay. So uh, last, I just, this is my team. Um, this is our team. This is the fondue team. We, early on in my career, we all went to a fondue restaurant, ate fondue. It's become a thing, unfortunately. Uh, I like to joke that if I were to get a tattoo, the tattoo I should get should be do not eat fondue on my hand. <laughs> really makes my stomach sick. But um, this is what we call ourselves. And so this is the fondue team, um, a couple of former members, Allison, who's now a professor at MSU, uh, Hao Lu, a data scientist at Conversant, Dan Marley, who works at an incredible company, Stats, that does data analysis for sports teams. Um, and of course, Garrett and Rachel, who've helped me out today, um, as well as many others. So uh, thank you. <laughs>